We made it to March 2019, and next week is my birthday. Happy birthday to me. Happy birthday to me. Happy... Oh, I forgot. I'm not allowed to sing anymore. In that case, happy birthday to me. Happy birthday to me. Happy birthday, dear me. Happy birthday to me. For my birthday, I am taking the week off. I will not have a new video review next week. That means this is my birthday review. And for my birthday, I can review anything I want. For my birthday, I want to review something special. It's Special Mission Brazil. Core Commander 788 here. It's time for another vintage G.I. Joe toy review. This week we are looking at another rare G.I. Joe toy. We're not looking at just one action figure. We're looking at five action figures and one cassette tape. In 1986, G.I. Joe sent a special mission to Brazil. But G.I. Joe is already in Brazil. Sort of. Brazil had its own version of G.I. Joe called Commandos MSAO. The toys were licensed and produced by a company called Estrella, using the molds from U.S. toys. I only have one Brazilian figure, Stalker, my favorite character. I have to thank Mr. Ulrich for sending it to me. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks also to Kevin from SEO Toy Review for giving me the mainframe figure from this set. He handed it to me at JoeCon last year. Year. Thanks very much, Kevin. I appreciate it. Make sure you check out his toy review channel. When you think about the entertainment media supporting G.I. Joe in the 80s, you probably think about the comic book and the cartoon. But that wasn't the only way to follow the adventures of G.I. Joe. Audio story cassettes were popular at the time. I remember having Star Wars audio cassettes, and I would listen to them maybe even more than I watched the movie. And the cool thing about audio tapes is you can record record on them too. And as a kid, I did record my own adventures on audio cassette. I would do all the voices and all the sound effects. Sometimes I'd even make my brother do voices too. In 1986, G.I. Joe used the medium of the audio cassette to give kids a new little adventure and to give them the opportunity to make their own. Let's look at this rare set of commandos in action to see what special mission G.I. Joe had in Brazil. HC CC788 presents Special Mission Brazil. This is Special Mission Brazil. This set of five G.I. Joe action figures was available in 1986 only. It was discontinued for the 1987 series. This set was sold exclusively at Toys R Us. This five pack of figures was mostly made up of recolored figures from the 1986 series. Only one figure was new, but it was made up of reused parts from earlier action figures figures. The set includes Mainframe version 2, Dial Tone version 2, Claymore, Leatherneck version 2, and Wetsuit version 2. The set came with an audio tape. We will take a closer look at that later. The practice of issuing figures in multi-packs was not uncommon in the vintage G.I. Joe line. Reissuing old figures with new colors was also common. Creating new characters using entirely reused parts has been done many times. G.I. Joe even issued a figure with an audio tape before. It is exceptional that all of those elements came together for one set. Is Special Mission Brazil a sub-team? I don't count it as one. It's just a squad brought together for a single specific mission. It doesn't have an ongoing role on the team, like Tiger Force or Ninja Force. It was standard practice to select a few Joes for specific missions. It seems that's what they've done here. I don't know why they would need special uniforms for it, though. Why Brazil? The audio tape story is set in Brazil. Other than that, there's no special reason for Brazil to be specified. Brazil seems to have been selected at random. 
in the various storylines surrounding G.I. Joe, the team doesn't have a major presence in Brazil. In the comic book series, G.I. Joe often operated in South America, but it was usually in the fictional country of Sierra Gordo. Of course, there was G.I. Joe in Brazil. Brazil had its own version of G.I. Joe called Commandos M. Assao. It included the figures from the American line, but of course they were updated and altered for the Brazilian market, so they look a little different from the the American versions. Of course, American G.I. Joe never acknowledged its international counterparts, but how awesome would it have been for G.I. Joe to team up with Commandos Emasau? For the four reissued figures, Dial Tone, Mainframe, Leatherneck, and Wetsuit, their second versions were released the same year as their first versions. That didn't happen very often, but it did happen. For example, the first and second versions of Sergeant Slaughter were released in 1986. Why these figures? According to former Hasbro executive Kirk Bozigian, Toys R Us wanted an exclusive set for their stores. New toys take a lot of time to design and develop, so the only practical way to give Toys R Us something special was to recolor existing product. By 1986, G.I. Joe was licensing its toys around the world, so the tooling would be shipped to other countries for their use. Older tooling wasn't necessarily available to Hasbro. The tooling for these 1986 figures was still in Hasbro's possession, so it was easy to stamp out these guys in different colors. They must have had some 1985 molds available because a lot of 1985 parts were used to make up Claymore. The format for this review will be a little different from what I usually do because we have five figures to look at and a cassette tape. I'll take a short look at Dial Tone, Leatherneck, mainframe and wetsuit. They are reissued figures and we've already looked at their first versions. I'll take a more in-depth look at Claymore since he is the only new character in this set. A word about the accessories. The accessories for the Special Mission Brazil figures appear to be the same as the first version figures, with one exception and of course that exception applies to Claymore. I wasn't sure about this because sometimes reissued accessories have very subtle differences from the original that are hard to detect, but I consulted Mark Balomo's Ultimate Guide to G.I. Joe, and that guide also says these accessories are the same. The accessories all came in a single sealed bag. They weren't distributed among the figures, but it was obvious to tell which accessories went with which figure because these were reissued accessories from the earlier figures, and the only two accessories that didn't go with earlier action figures, therefore had to be Claymores. Let's start by looking at Dial Tone, the communication specialist. His accessories included his submachine gun uh, that is in light gray. This appears to be the same as the submachine gun that came with the first version. The color appears to be the same. The mold appears to be the same. Uh, I see no differences with the naked eye. He also had his communication backpack. Uh, it had a microphone that would swing down and also swing up to be out of the way. Uh, this backpack is in the same light gray color as the submachine gun. Pretty cool looking high-tech backpack. Again, this appears to be the same backpack uh, as the one issued with version 1. Same color and same mold. Looking at the sculpt design and color of Special Mission Brazil Dial Tone, we can see it is a departure from the first version. Uh, he still has his black beret with a silver beret flash, but instead of having a brown mustache and brown hair, uh, his hair has turned black. I guess he dyed his hair black specifically for this mission. The top half of this figure is actually really good. It has more subdued colors than the original, with a brown vest, green straps with grenades, a black undershirt. That yellow unit patch really pops against that black sleeve. Overall, this is really good. Of course, there are two halves to this figure, and the bottom half is what really makes the difference. 
Uh, him have red pants. Yes, he has red, totally not camouflaged pants. He has a black device on his right leg. He has green knee pads. He has green boots and an unpainted red knife on his left ankle. Now, the Special Mission Brazil figure is somewhat rare, and the original dial tone figure is common. If you really wanted to do a custom with the rare figure, the top half of version 2 would go really well with the bottom half of version 1. Just for fun, I popped these figures apart and put the top half of version 2 together with the bottom half of version 1 so you could see what that looks like, and I think it looks great. Now, the greens do not match from the top to the bottom half, so it's not perfect, but the blacks go really great together. This could be a Night Force version of Dial Tone. There were four versions of Dial Tone in the vintage G.I. Joe line. The first three were based on that 1986 mold. The final version was not. Unfortunately, I do not have version three or four to show you. The file card has the same text as the version one file card. I have not found any differences in the text. The portrait was updated, though, to show the differences in colors on the action figure. The printing quality seems to be different between the two file cards. The version 1 file card seems to be better. This file card has a red back, and you should have tear marks on it. That's because these file cards were printed on the back of the inserts inside the box, and the figures were glued on bubbles onto that backing. So to get the figures off, you would have to tear the bubble off, and that would tear the backing on these cards. There is one exception to this, and that is Claymore. We will get to that later. Now let's take a look at Leatherneck. This is easily my favorite figure from this set. I'm a big fan of Leatherneck, and this is a nice version of Leatherneck. There's nothing crazy on this figure, no red pants, just a nice desert-colored version of Leatherneck. Version 1 of Leatherneck, was camouflaged for the jungle. So we have green instead of tan and brown. And version 1 had a camouflage pattern on his uniform uh, that is missing on version 2. Uh, so version 1, of course, is one of my all-time favorite figures. I love this uniform. I love this figure. It's nice to see a leather neck in a uniform for a different environment. This is basically a desert version of leather neck. His accessories included his M16 rifle with grenade launcher. Uh, again, one of my favorite accessories from the vintage line. I always loved this accessory. He also had his green backpack. Uh, with the USMC on the top, uh, on the bedroll there, and a canteen. Uh, great accessories. I like them on the original, and I like them on this figure, too. Again, I have to reiterate, this appears to be the same accessory as version 1. Uh, now, on this version 1 rifle, it does have a number 5 molded on it, and on my Special Mission Brazil, it has a number 8. Now, that most likely indicates its position on the sprue when it was being molded. Um, so you see that kind of difference on G.I. Joe accessories from time to time, but that does not indicate uh, an update to the mold. It appears they used the same mold for both rifles. And that goes for the backpack as well. They appear to be the same backpack. I have to address the elephant in the room. This version of Leatherneck is supposed to be on a special mission in Brazil, but he is dressed for the desert, and Brazil doesn't really have deserts. However, Brazil does have a region that has rolling sand dunes, and Leatherneck's uniform would be fine for that area. I don't really care, though. For me, this is Desert Storm Leatherneck. I will happily send him on desert missions with Dusty. The file card for Special Mission Brazil Leatherneck appears to be the same text as version 1, um, and again, we have that faded printing on the Special Mission Brazil version. Uh, the text uh, isn't quite as dark black as version 1. And I do have two Leatherneck file cards from the Special Mission Brazil set, and they both have that faded printing on it. Uh, the printing quality just doesn't seem to be as good on these Special Mission Brazil cards. The portraits are updated to reflect the color changes on the action figure, but the portrait on the Special Mission Brazil card still has the camouflage on the hat, even though the action figure did not have camouflage 
at all. This portrait of Leatherneck, of course, is made to look like Ron Rudat. Ron Rudat was a toy designer at Hasbro, and he is responsible for designing most, nearly all, of the G.I. Joe action figures from the early years. Leatherneck, of course, is a Marine, but he's not the only Marine on this mission. There is one other. This is Mainframe, the computer specialist and the other Marine in the Special Mission Brazil set. And oh my god, the colors. Yes, we will talk about it, but we need to cover some other things first. His accessories included a computer. It is gray, and it's a big, bulky 80s portable computer. Uh, this appears to be the same as the computer that came with version 1. Same color and the same mold. He also had a communications microphone uh, that connected to a long black hose that connected to his backpack. Uh, of course, the black hose was pretty standard on a lot of G.I. Joe figures, so there wouldn't really be any difference between version 1 and version 2. Um, and that tiny black microphone uh, also appears to be the same. Uh, this is, without a doubt, the most frequently missing piece. That black connector hose connects to a little knob on the back corner of his backpack, so he can use his communications microphone with his communications backpack. Uh, that backpack itself uh, is gray. Uh, it has an antenna on it. That antenna is often broken, so do be careful about that. Uh, and this backpack appears to be the same as the backpack that came with version 1. Okay, let's talk about that uniform. He no longer has his light gray jumpsuit with black and silver highlights and details. Now he has a khaki shirt with kind of pinkish red highlights and a pinkish red helmet and bright red Trousers. This is the most dramatic change between version 1 and version 2 among the figures in this set. For Cobra Convergence last year, Retro Blasting did a hilarious video that included this figure, so you should check that out. Obviously, this color scheme is not going to go over well with me. I think it looks hideous. Now, Mainframe is a computer specialist. He is a technician. Uh, he could stay at the base but he is supposed to be on a special mission in Brazil. He went into the jungles of Brazil dressed like this. The file card, as with the other ones we looked at, uh, uses the same text as version one with that faded printing as we've seen before. I don't know if I just got a bad batch or what, uh, but the printing on all of my special mission file cards is faded uh, with the exception of Claymore. Once again, we have the portrait updated to reflect the colors on the action figure. Uh, the colors on the portrait are not quite as garish as the action figure. They kind of uh, tried to make it a little more subtle, but we do see that he now has that reddish pink hat instead of his black one. And this is another red back file card with a tear on the back. One unfortunate thing about these tears is that it makes the card a little thinner at that spot, so it can be prone to bending and creasing. Next we have wetsuit the Navy SEAL, who is equipped as a diver. This is another dramatic departure from version 1, with version 1 having a predominantly aqua-colored diving suit and an orangey-yellow helmet. Wetsuit version 2 has a silver diving suit. Gone is the orangey-yellow helmet. He now has a silver helmet, and he has some blue and green highlights. The figure has the same accessories as version 1, and I'm going to leave these accessories on the figure. Here. The accessories can be difficult to get on. I've had to remove them a couple times for this review. Now that I have them back on, I'm just going to leave them. The accessories include a black air hose that connects to the head on the action figure, uh, and those hoses run to the backpack and connect to some holes in the backpack. That can be a bit fiddly to get on the figure and the backpack. That is, of course, the same as the version 1 figure, also had a black air hose that connected to the backpack. Uh, the backpack itself is also the same in an orangey yellow color. That's supposed to be an air tank backpack. Uh, looks like they used exactly the same backpack. He has an underwater flashlight in an orangey yellow, the same color as the backpack. Uh, this is made of a soft, flexible plastic. It has a loop. Uh, that loop is flexible, as is the rest of the flashlight. Um, that is, again, the same 
same as the first version and it's also in that same soft plastic material. He also came with this self-propelled diving plane. It is also in that orangey yellow plastic. This is not soft plastic though. This is hard plastic and that handle can be a bit thick so be cautious putting it in the figure's hand. The final accessories are swim fins which attach to the feet of the action figure. Uh, they are black. I like them because I can use them as figure stands and these are of course the same as the swim fins on the version 1 figure. Here we see a problem with using the exact same accessories in the same colors. On the version 1 of wetsuit the accessories complemented the colors on the action figure pretty well. The action figure even had a helmet that was in the same color as the accessories. On the special mission Brazil version of wetsuit he has totally different colors. He no longer has that orangey yellow helmet that matches the colors on the accessories and the accessory color does not fit the figure very well. Let's look at this figure without those accessories. I know I said I would leave the accessories on but I changed my mind because you deserve to see this figure without the distraction of the accessories. What we have here is a really nice silver colored diving suit. Uh, we've got black details. Uh, we've got dark blue on the shoulders, on the arms, on the legs and on the chest. Um, that is really nice. A very rich, dark color of blue. And then we have some green just to set that off a bit. Um, I really think this is great. Um, I really like the change uh, to the silver color. Uh, I think it works really well for wetsuit. Since we looked at Shipwreck version 2 a few weeks ago, I wanted to show you these guys side by side. And as mentioned in the Shipwreck review, the bottom half half of Shipwreck uses parts from Wetsuit. So it's the same bottom half on both of these figures, only the colors are different. I think these figures go really well together. On Shipwreck, you have gray, black, and silver. And on Wetsuit, you have silver, black, and blue. Uh, they just look great side by side. They look like they are ready for the same mission. These guys should be teammates. It's nice to see Leatherneck and Wetsuit in the same set, on the same mission. In the G.I. Joe animated series, these two guys had kind of a rivalry going. They didn't like each other very much, so it's kind of fun to see them forced to work together. On the file card, it is much the same as the other file cards we've looked at. Uh, we have the same text as version 1. We have kind of faded printing on it, and we have a portrait that updates the colors from version 1 to version 2. I do have to note a variation on the version 1 file card uh, on this bottom paragraph the sentence that says pretty amazing considering that the level to which he developed his toughness would seem to indicate a full-time occupation that's what most of the file cards say but there are a few file cards floating around out there that say the level to which he developed his orneriness and cussedness would seem to indicate a full-time occupation they seem to have changed orneriness and cussedness to toughness the reason I bring that up is to note that the version 2 file card uses the toughness line, not the orneriness and cussedness line. So if there are two variations on this file card, which one is the official one? Well, in G.I. Joe, Order of Battle issue number 2, on the entry for wetsuit, it uses the toughness line. However, I prefer orneriness and cussedness. It's more colorful. Again, note the red back on this file card. This one, fortunately, without tear marks. Now let's look at the new character for Special Mission Brazil, Claymore. This is a new figure with no new tooling or accessories. They made something out of nothing. This is similar to what they did in 1988 with Sky Striker for Tiger Force, creating a new character with all used parts and accessories. This is the most desirable figure from the set and the hardest to find. Why? 
probably because it's the only new character. If a collector only wants one figure from the Special Mission Brazil set, it's probably this one. It's been pointed out, and I think it's worth noting, with his leopard print uniform, Claymore looks a little bit like Craven the Hunter, the Marvel Comics villain. The name Claymore may refer to a Scottish broadsword used in the 15th through 17th centuries. It may also refer to the M18 Claymore mine a directional anti-personnel mine. The mine, of course, is named after the sword. Claymore had two accessories, and one of them had a variation. Uh, he had a weapon, an Uzi in black, uh, and this you may recognize. This appears to be a copy of the Uzi that came with 1985 Snake Eyes version 2. A lot of Claymores came with this accessory, but some of the accessory bags with Special Mission Brazil came with a copy of the Uzi that was originally issued with 1986 Low Light. It's another Uzi accessory, but with a different design. Claymore's other accessory is his helmet. Uh, this helmet is in green. Uh, it has some detail on it. It has netting and some leaves for camouflage. Uh, this helmet is also not new. This helmet was originally issued with 1985 Footloose. Of course, Footloose's helmet is in a slightly different green color, and it has paint. It has a paint application on those leaves that is not on Claymore's helmet. Looking at the articulation on Claymore, he had the articulation that was standard for G.I. Joe figures by 1986, so he could turn his head from left to right and look up and down. He could swing his arm up at the shoulder and swivel at the shoulder all the way around. Uh, he had a hinge at the elbow that allowed him to bend his arm at the elbow about 90 degrees. He had a swivel at the bicep that allowed him to swivel his arm all the way around. The figure was held together with a rubber O-ring that looped around the inside. That allowed him to move at the torso a bit. He could move his legs apart about so far. He could bend his legs at the hip about 90 degrees, and he could bend at the knee about 90 degrees. Looking at the sculpt design and color of Claymore, he has black hair, and he has a black mustache. This head is a reuse of the head that was originally on the 1985 Footloose, but he had brown hair and a brown mustache. So this is totally not Footloose because because he has black hair instead of brown. But then is this not dial tone because he has black hair instead of brown? Ah, forget it. On his chest, he has a green tactical vest, and that vest has a sculpted in crisscross pattern on it. That's on the front and the back. On the front of the vest, he has a couple brown pockets, and under that vest, he has an orangey-yellow shirt with a brown leopard print pattern on it. This is a reuse of the chest on the 1985 Televiper, although I have to say the green does it some good. The Televiper chest uh, didn't have a lot of contrast in the colors, so the green vest really does bring out the details on the vest for Claymore. Unfortunately, he has that leopard shirt under it. His arms are in that orangey-yellow color with the brown leopard spots. He has rolled-up sleeves, bare forearms. He has brown gloves and a black watch on his left wrist. These arms are a reuse of the arms from 1985 Flint. While we have Flint out here, let's look at his waist because Claymore reuses the waist piece from Flint. On his waist, he has a brown belt and silver belt buckles and bullets uh, and that is over that orangey yellow color with the leopard print pattern. Actually he has two belts. They are overlapping and one of them slings down a little lower on his right side. It is unpainted but it is sculpted to go over the other belt. You can see it painted on the back side, but on the front, uh, that second belt over on the right side of his hip is unpainted. That is painted uh, on flint, so that is uh, an unpainted detail on Claymore. And it kind of makes a difference, because uh, where it looks like he has a single belt buckle, that's actually two belt buckles overlapping. There's a circular U.S. belt buckle that is over what looks like 
an eagle-shaped belt buckle. That is done much better on flint than it is on claymore. On his legs he has that yellowy-orange color with the brown spots. He has a pocket on each thigh. Uh, he has green boots, and those boots do have some brown details on them. That's an extra paint application. Very nice. Then he has a black knife on his left ankle and a pair of black straps that go around his left boot. These legs are a reuse of the legs from 1985 Dusty, but of course the colors are dramatically different. The overall look of this figure is absurd. It's crazy. It's got leopard print camouflage. This figure actually reminds me of Leatherneck version 3 from 1993. Leatherneck was one of Claymore's Special Mission Brazil teammates. If outlandish animal prints is to be the hallmark of Special Mission Brazil, then maybe this should have been Special Mission Brazil Leatherneck. Now that I think of it, this third version of Leatherneck could have been a second version of Claymore. They wouldn't have had to change the figure at all. Just call it Claymore version 2. It looks more like Claymore than Leatherneck. Let's take a look at Claymore's file card, and this file card is different from all the other Special Mission Brazil file cards we have looked at. This is not a copy of any other file card. It is unique. It also has uh, better printing. It doesn't have the faded text that we saw on the other file cards. This portrait is an update of the portrait on the Footloose file card. It doesn't look like it at first glance because it is at a different angle and it's kind of zoomed in. But if you match up the angles on the two faces, you can see it is just an update of Footloose. They painted over Footloose to make it into Claymore. It has his faction as G.I. Joe, and it even has G.I. Joe in his specialty. In case there's any doubt about who he is working for, he is G.I. Joe Covert Operations, codename Claymore. His file name is John Zulo. His primary military specialty is anti-terrorist specialist. Secondary military specialty is martial arts. Birthplace is Manchester, Vermont, and his grade is captain. John Zulo may be named after Frank Zulo, a mayor of Norwalk, Connecticut in the 1960s and 70s. Now, you may think that's a stretch, but this file card does not look like it was written by Larry Hama, the writer of the G.I. Joe comic book, which means means it was probably written by an employee at Hasbro. Hasbro headquarters is in New England, in Rhode Island specifically, and whenever Hasbro would write a file card, they often had references to New England, and there are several references to New England in this file card. On this file card, we don't just get the standard two paragraphs, we get three paragraphs. This first paragraph says, Claymore was born to the son of an immigrant who came to this country to work work in the marble quarries of Vermont. A graduate of Dartmouth College in New Hampshire, Claymore finished at the top of his class with a major in Eastern philosophy. He's a master at Japanese, Chinese, Vietnamese, and Portuguese languages. There is more than one Chinese language, so does that mean he speaks Mandarin Chinese? Also, Portuguese is probably a reference to his mission in Brazil, since Portuguese is the official language of Brazil. Vermont and Dartmouth College are both references to New England. This middle paragraph says he enlisted in the army and served three hitches back to back somewhere in Southeast Asia. Where in Southeast Asia? Who can know? His work there was and still is classified. Attended airborne and ranger school, qualified expert in all NATO small arm and long range sniper rifles, as well as all NATO and Warsaw Pact explosive devices. Proficient in all forms of martial arts. This bottom paragraph says, joined the Joe team at the insistence of Hawk. His only stipulation was that he be called in on special assignments only. Hawk agreed. Claymore is respected by all branches of the armed services, and his reputation as a soldier is known far and wide. Few men have ever seen Claymore, but those who have served under him have not and will never forget him. At the very bottom, we have a disclaimer. The name John Zulo does not identify identify any known living person. This file card is just too good to be true. This is another indication to me that it was not written by Larry Hama. It was written by somebody at Hasbro. There is no subtlety in this file card. He's just the best of the best of the best. 
at everything. Taking a look at how Special Mission Brazil was used in G.I. Joe Media, well, they weren't used in G.I. Joe Media, at least not in this form. The reissued figures all appeared many times in the comic book series published by Marvel Comics and the animated series, but they wore their other uniforms, not their Special Mission Brazil uniforms. Claymore did not appear in the comic book series or the animated series. In the vintage era, he made one appearance and one appearance only on the tape. The Special Mission Brazil set came with this tape, this audio cassette. Uh, it is black with a white label, and side A has the story, Special Mission Brazil. Harris and Roman Productions is credited with producing this tape. Only side A has a story on it, side B is blank, and you are supposed to record your own mission on side B. Unfortunately, nothing was recorded on the side Side B of my tape. I think it would have been great to have some kid's adventure recorded on this tape, but mine is blank. This gimmick was used before. In 1985, Listen and Fun Tripwire, which was a recolored reissue of the 1983 Tripwire figure, included an audio cassette. Uh, this cassette was yellow with a black label. It was titled The Cobra's Revenge, and it had two stories. One on each side. These two cassette tapes are only a year apart, but they are quite different. Uh, th there's less on the Special Mission Brazil tape. Like I said, side B is blank. But the production value of the Special Mission Brazil tape is a bit better than the Tripwire tape. Although they didn't use this specific gimmick again, in 1990, the action figure Rapid Fire came with a video cassette. A video cassette set that included an episode of the animated series. On the tape, G.I. Joe's special mission in Brazil is to retrieve a downed satellite that has crashed in the jungle of Brazil. Deep in the Mato Grosso jungles of Brazil, Captain Claymore of G.I. Joe leads four other members of this elite force. They are Wetsuit, Leatherneck, Dial Tone, and Mainframe. Their mission is to retrieve a downed informational satellite lost somewhere in this dark, savage land before Cobra can get their reptilian hands on it. The voices are kind of silly, but it's better than the voice acting on the Tripwire tape. Cobra Commander's voice sounds a little closer to the voice from the animated series. It sounds like they were trying to imitate the voices from the TV show, but without using the original voice actors. According to our sources, the G.I. Joe satellite has fallen very near here. And what about G.I. Joe? I've arranged a small reception committee for them. <laughs> The story isn't that great, but it could be worse. Again, I think it is better than the Listen and Fun Tripwire tape. I put the question to you. Did you have this tape? And if you did have it, did you record your own adventure on Side B? I did not have this tape as a kid, but if I did, I would have loved to record my own G.I. Joe adventure on this tape. Taking a look at the Special Mission Brazil set overall, if I were only measuring my subjective feelings about having the set, it would be top tier. But objectively, the set comes in closer to the middle tier, with a lot of variation within the set. You have Leatherneck, which I think is probably a top tier figure, and then you have Mainframe at the bottom tier. There are some things in this set that are just weird. As far as the figures go, there's nothing new. Even the new character is just a Frankenstein. Reusing parts doesn't automatically make a figure bottom tier, but it is a strike against it. Claymore is bizarre looking. The leopard print is just odd. If you read the file card, the guy is a genius super soldier. The uniform looks like some upholstery my mom would pick out for her couch. The other recolored figures are hit and miss. Mainframe and dial tone are inexplicable. Leatherneck looks great though. I wouldn't send him to Brazil in that uniform, but he looks great for a desert mission. 
and wetsuit looks pretty good in silver. The story on the tape is all right. The tape is a nice bonus. I do have to give it credit for that. It is an improvement on the tripwire tape from the year before. They wouldn't win an Academy Award for it, but it does make the set special. The whole set reminds me of the international figures we've seen on the show before. G.I. Joe went around the world and was enjoyed by children in dozens of countries. Each country put its own stamp on G.I. Joe. Sometimes they would change the name, they would often change the figures, they would change the colors around, and sometimes even create new figures out of spare parts. As a set of U.S. characters sent on a special mission in Brazil, this set is maybe a little silly, but through this set we can learn to appreciate how G.I. Joe appeared in other countries. G.I. Joe wasn't just a real American hero, he was a hero in Canada, Mexico, Argentina, South Africa, the UK, and most of Europe, and in Brazil too. That was my birthday review of Special Mission Brazil. I hope you enjoyed it. Just a reminder, I will be off next week, so no new review next week, but I'll be back the week after that. And the next review will be chosen by a patron's choice poll, so I look forward to seeing what you guys decide you want to see. There are so many big things coming up in the next few months. The channel's five-year anniversary is coming up soon. Then we have Joe Fest in June, and uh, we may have something else special coming after that. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up on YouTube. Please consider subscribing to the channel and hitting the notification bell. And share this video with your friends. That's what helps this channel grow. As always, I want to thank my supporters on Patreon. Your support makes this show possible. I really could not do it without you, so thank you very much. If you like the show and you'd like to support the show in that way, please check out my Patreon. You can learn how to decode the secret messages you see in videos. I will not be back next week, but I'll be back the week after that. Now that's a long time to wait, and in all that time, make sure you remember, only G.I. Joe is G.I. Joe. What's that?